uh, for having us, having Dane Arts um, sponsor these workshops. Um, we're really looking forward to being able to help provide working artists opportunities to build their skill sets as business owners and, um, and allies and uh, community members. So that's what these workshops are for, is to help people um, that are in the creative community build their uh, skill sets um, as business owners. Um, so we are really excited that Dane Arts is able to assist um, and sponsor this uh, workshop Wednesday series. Uh, but tonight we have with us, we have Carlos and he is leading a workshop on, so you want to be an ally turning your good intentions um, into, uh, oh, Carlos, I apologize, into results. results. <laughs> results. You want that. Um, <laughs> so um, I'm excited to share that. I think it's very um, right on topic with what's happening out there in our community, both in Madison and throughout Dane County and throughout the country. Um, and potentially the world as well. So this is a really um, spot on topic and we're really looking forward to hearing what Carlos has to share with us from his experience. Um, and we will be providing the recording afterwards. It will be um, viewable, shareable uh, on YouTube. So uh, we will send out that any notes and any other information that we have, we'll share out after um, this workshop. And you are always welcome to share that with other creative uh, people in your community. Um, and invite them to the next workshop. And I'll talk about that at the very end. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Carlos. Thanks for having uh, being here tonight. Thank you to Megan and Sarah and to Dan Arts for having me. Um, so I actually have a written handout that talks about everything that I bring up in this course. So you don't have to worry about taking notes or anything. You can just look at the handout. Um, so just real quick, welcome everybody. I know this has been a hard week and a hard year, so I appreciate folks making the time for this. Uh, some quick housekeeping. Uh, this is not an all-encompassing bird's eye view of allyship. It's a first person view. Everything I talk about is either from lived experience or taught to me by a professional. Instead of explaining my credentials, I'm gonna just tell you my story and all the lessons I learned along the way, and you can decide if I'm credible or not. Um, if you have comments or concerns, uh, the easiest way is just write it in the chat and then either Sarah or Megan will let me know. The definitions in particular are simplified, so feel free to elaborate in the comments. Um, and I will be talking about real events. Not everything was positive. I'm not trying to publicly call out anybody, so I'll generally leave those names out of the discussion. My focus is on the lesson from that experience. And so we'll just get started. I'll just share my screen. And I'll just be talking over slides. So let's start here. Um, so real quick about myself. My name is Carlos Eduardo Gacharna. My preferred gender pronouns are he, him, his. We'll talk about that more in a bit. So a quick recognition for the folks in Madison, you are on occupied Ho-Chunk land. I'm coming to you from Long Beach, California, which is occupied Tongva land. So just so we know where we're at. Um, and one thing that I will talk about is when it comes to getting educated on issues about allyship. So here it says, make a mistake, get over yourself, learn from black educators. So one thing I will say is if you're trying to get that information, make sure that people are getting paid. So I'm an ally and I'm offering this as a free service, but if you're, you know, worried about racism against black people and you're going to contact a black person for that education, make sure that you're like paying for their time. Uh, so one example is I'm trying to learn more about indigenous issues. So I'm working with the indigenous circle of wellness and I'm paying professionals to get access to that information. Um, so I will just real quick talking about active allyship. So that would be recognizing the struggles of people whose identities differ from your own and working with them to create a, a more just and equitable world versus performative allyship, which is making public displays of solidarity without actually investing any time, energy, or resources. So for example, the infamous Black Square on Instagram, millions of people posted it, nothing happened, right? So just to differentiate about myself, I am, sorry, where are we at? Okay, so I'm originally from Colombia, so I'm a mixed European descent and then of Muisca indigenous blood. So on the right, you're actually seeing a map of uh, Muisca territory. So that's where I get my last name from is, uh, it's Chipcha. So that's, that's the language spoken by the Muisca. Um, but I grew up in Madison, which is, you know, that's Madison. It's cold. <laughs> 
And, uh, you know, I, I had kind of a tumultuous time. I attended six different public schools and I definitely felt marginalized without place. And kind of the outlet for me was I started partying a lot and skipping school and trying to escape. So that's me at 16. <laughs> and I actually ended up getting five underage okay. drinking tickets in that time. Um, and part of that led me here to Centro Hispano where I had my introduction to restorative justice. So restorative justice is a system of criminal justice that focuses on empathy and rehabilitation of criminal offenders while meeting the needs of the community that they hurt. So at Centro Hispano, they had a program called Convida where you could do community service hours and you would do things like uh, art projects, host candlelight vigils against violence, art workshops with college students versus, you know, just cleaning trash. And really it was my first exposure to Latinx folks doing something productive with their lives outside of my family. Um, and so one thing we did is we actually went on a tour of MATC with Ananda Mirili. This is 11 years ago. So it was before she was a school board rep. <laughs> uh, but one of the things that I wanna mention is the idea of paying it forward. So for the folks that have gone through these programs and have come out the other side empowered to just reach back and make sure that that path stays open. So in this case, I actually got to take a group of Convida students to 100 State and to Zendesk to expose them to the technology to, uh, sector in Madison. I also had an intern cat from Centro Hispano and the, the last event that I did before moving out of Madison was a fundraiser for Centro Hispano. So, you know, just pay it forward. Uh, but going back to high school, um, so at the start of high school, I didn't really care about school. I wasn't trying, but when I took ceramics my junior year of high school, within two weeks, I was completely hooked and I was spending all my time on it because for the first time, I really discovered the value of learning and to just that the more that I worked on something, the better that it would be. And, uh, you know, so for me, art was definitely a survival strategy because it was the only department in school where I felt comfortable. And so I really give credit to uh, my instructor, Jeff Herman, about to just make a, a place where I could just feel good and just be somewhere. So I think that's a really important lesson for educators is that it's not just about education, it's also just creating a space where people just feel welcome and safe. Uh, so I did actually uh, eight semesters of ceramics within two years, so I was deep in it. And then my senior year of high school, so this was the Scott Walker protests. Um, and so for the folks that don't know, in 2011, uh, the governor at the time, he got rid of collective bargaining rights for educators and it sparked tens of thousands of people protesting in the Capitol Square for weeks. And uh, they actually shut down school for a week. And one of the things that happened is, you know, I went to all these different schools. So I had friends that were organizing at West and I had friends that were organizing at Memorial. So I put them in communication and all of us together, we started organizing marches with all the West Side High Schools from West to the Capitol where it would be thousands of kids. And one of the things that I'd learned is just how much more motivated and organized high schoolers are compared to college students. Um, but it was also just learning how to be loud and take up space when fighting against issues of injustice. So um, I went to UW-Madison through the People Program, which is an affirmative action program. So it's a pre-college scholarship program where if you start taking classes over the course of the summers and you finally get accepted into UW-Madison, they'll give you free tuition for four years. But uh, that's an affirmative action program. So affirmative action is a system that factors in an individual's color, race, sex, religion, or national origin to increase opportunities for marginalized members of society. And my fall semester, we had an organization called CO come in and try to sue UW-Madison over their affirmative action policies like the people program. And so what we did is we literally went to their press conference and we shut it down. <laughs> and then uh, it ended up going to the courts and CEO ended up losing and we got to stay. But I think it's not said that we all deserved to be there. But again, just getting radicalized. This is kind of the background that got things going. Um, and then so one of my first jobs was teaching GED and then specifically being a Spanish GED instructor with Omega and then Latino Academy. So here I started teaching art workshops where it was mostly adults of parents who were working multiple jobs that were trying to get their high school diploma. And uh, we actually graduated 
65 students over the course of 18 months between three instructors. And just one highlight is I actually had a class where I had the abuelita, the dad, and the daughter all learning math from me at the same time. So that was a powerful experience. But the thing with Latino Academy and Omega is that they're very patriarchal, director down organizations. And I kind of suffered in that environment. So I ended up working for Janice Spears, who you see in the purple, which is really significant because I was leaving a patriarchal workspace for one defined by non cis male leadership and cross cultural coalition building. So we'll just go through some vocab real quick. You have this in your notes. So patriarchy or hegemonic masculinity is defined as a practice that legitimizes men's dominant position in society at the expense of others. So racism and patriarchy are systems of oppression that hurt both the oppressed and the oppressor. So oppressed obviously is getting downtrodden, but the oppressor it robs you of empathy, self-expression, personal style, emotion, hobbies, etc. You'll hear me use the word cis and trans. So they're an identity you choose depending on if you agree or not with the gender you were assigned at birth. Cisgender or cis for short, you identify with the gender you were assigned at birth. Your gender expression and identity align. Cis means same. Trans is an umbrella term that anyone can identify as. There's different layers, safeties, privileges within that. There's no one way to be trans. Transgendered is problematic. So the gender binary, it's the way that society has defined gender. Gender is a social construct. Gender expression is the external expression of that inner self, generally on the masculine feminine spectrum. Non-binary or gender queer means that you reject the gender binary completely and construct your own identity outside of that system. Heteronormativity is a social construct. It's what society considers normal, and by normal, it means straight. There is danger in living outside of heteronormativity. So the example I give is when I'm in Colombia and Madison, I'm generally seen as a straight male. But in LA and especially in Brazil, a lot of people think I'm gay because I don't fit heteronormativity. So that's when I've had issues of uh, men following me on the street, of cars trying to pick me up, of people not believing me when I'm not gay. Like, those are all dangers that come from being outside heteronormativity. And this is something that plenty of people go through every day, you know, cat calling and so forth. So uh, femme, it's an inclusive term that refers to all folks that choose to express themselves on the feminine side of the spectrum. Queer is a relative term, but generally refers to everyone under the LGBTQIA umbrella. It's originally a slur, but has been reclaimed by the community. And then cross-cultural coalition building. It's building strength and unity with people and communities outside of your own culture. So Janice, and again, in the purple, she started her career providing immigration services for Russian Jews coming out of the Cold War. But in the 90s, there wasn't any more Russian Jews coming in. It was all these Latinos. And so, for example, there was the Mario boat launch. In, so this is between April and October 1980. 125,000 Cubans migrated from Cuba to the U.S. by boat. And many, quote, unquote, low-functioning individuals came since Castro emptied out the prisons and mental wards. So Janice would work with these folks and help them get their yearly uh, work permits. And also working with Mexican folks, Guatemalans. African folks, etc. Um, and again, well, here she doesn't even work for Jewish social services anymore. Now she works for the Catholic Multicultural Center as a Jewish woman. So really emphasizing the multicultural coalition building. Um, around this time, I started working for an organization called Rest Start. And so Rest Start was a restorative justice program where kids who had gotten problems with the law would set up collaborative mural workshops where in five community centers around the city and they would work on these murals and at the end of the program their charges would get dropped so it's a way to pay their debt to society and beautify the environment but it was also significant because no money was exchanged and no criminal record was accumulated so these are all my kids right here um, and then my first major project was organizing a youth citywide gallery night so we invited all the community centers, organizations from the city, a lot of food. You see the diversity of the students here, you know, and um, I'll just give a shout out to the alphas here. So the, they're the first black fraternity and they're one of the groups that came out. So they did a great job of filling the need for strong black father figures within this demographic. 
Um, but this experience was also eye-opening and that I learned that I could create cultural events that provided a platform for Black, Brown, Indigenous folks, queer, trans, non-binary individuals to come together through art. Uh, and so what happened is that in the spring, Becky actually had to leave the program because she got a different job. And so I thought it was done. But in July, I got a thousand dollar grant from the Puffin Foundation. And uh, so with the help of my professor, Gail Simpson and Becky, we decided to continue the program. And they connected me with Girls Inc. at the Goodman Community Center and the bubbler, which was needing programming because it's brand new. And then we started a whole other chapter of teaching art workshops for middle school girls. So on the left, that's Daniela. She was my first intern ever. And I've had, you know, close to 10 interns and assistants. But every week we would have a different artist, a different medium and a different space. And it was just a, an organic way to set up a mentorship system. Um, you see the diversity here. So those are college students working with my middle school girls. And I had my little sister's in the middle. So she was in the fourth grade at the time. So she's got to be around these cool, tough, older girls. Um, but yeah, the, so one of the issues was though, is that not all of our students were girls. So when we had our closing night, we called it girls night out. And that was actually a mistake because it kind of discouraged our non-girl students from coming out. And I knew a couple wanted to come and they didn't make it. So that was a mistake. Don't gender your events. Um, and in the spring, we were with Lucher Community Center. And so these are high schoolers, but the same format. And so this is Professor Helen Lee. So I actually transferred from ceramics to glass when I got to college. And she was great for a couple of things. One, because she was doing demos for my students. But then she also wrote a big grant for my middle school girls group where they got to go and bend neon with them. So again, just doubling down on cross-cultural coalition building. She did not have to do that, but she was, you know, applying her grant writing skills to help others. But all right, so I had these organizing skills. And so the next step is I wanted to provide a formal art space for young black and brown artists to bridge the gap between the campus bubble and the local community. So I, we made connections, which is what you see here. So again, it was addressing the lack of opportunities for young artists in the community. And a lot of fun, <laughs> but that was, that was the intro. And the next step was joining 100 State, which is a, a nonprofit co-working space. Cause I was looking for a, somewhere to host meetings, to do workshops, to plan events. But what really sold me on them was that they had this project where they put a piano on the top of State Street, which is historically where a lot of homeless folks would hang out. And I just thought it was a great way to create a point of community and a creative outlet for marginalized folks. And so I was like, all right, y'all are okay, we can hang out. <laughs> so we did, I organized two art shows in this space, hundreds and one night stand. Again, it's kind of like in opposition to the art department. So really reclaiming the corner of, St of State Street in the capital for young artists of color and intentionally over the top with some steakhouse catering, craft beer, life art, live art and music, et cetera. Um, and we, so photos from the events and we had a uh, art battle where artists would have a half hour freestyle and then we'd sell and auction the pieces and we donated that money to the YWCA. So I just wanna make a point about on donating money I think that folks should prioritize donating to small local nonprofits and crowdfunding campaigns over large organizations, including the YWCA, the Red Cross, United Way, Boys and Girls Club, even Black Lives Matter. So instead of these large organizations, go hyper local. So Freedom Inc., Unidos Against Domestic Violence, Domestic Abuse Intervention Services, Centro Hispano, et cetera. And the example I give is like the Red Cross during the Haiti earthquake crisis, they raised $500 million and only built six permanent homes. Yet they claim to have helped 4.5 million Haitians, which is the entire urban population of Haiti. Where did that money go? You tell me. <laughs> so instead, you know, look for these local organizations and it's okay to ask where to donate money if you don't know. It's not the same as asking for free education. So the example I give is, so I'm getting $150 from this workshop and I decided to donate it to my friend's organization, Hedge and Ami in, in Rio, where that $150 will translate to groceries for the week for eight families. 
So that, that level of impact is way higher than if I donated it to United Way and I have no idea where that money goes. Uh, so that's Pamela Castro. She's a great artist and she's also the founder. Um, I also work with Yuma Weirada, which creates a platform for Embedda indigenous artists to sell their work, especially right now, they're not allowed to sell work on the street. So they're really struggling to find opportunities to just support themselves. Um, and then after this time, I actually moved to Brazil and lived in South America for 14 months. So just a quick context on Brazil and the African diaspora. So the African diaspora is the diverse range of communities of African descent living outside of the continent. The largest populations are in Brazil, the US, Haiti, and Colombia. From about 1600 to 1850, some 4.5 million enslaved Africans were taken to Brazil. This is 10 times as many as were trafficked to North America. 1.9 million enslaved Africans were kidnapped and brought to Rio de Janeiro alone, just 38.3% of the population. So I was in Minas Gerais, which is this green big one right there. Uh, and so Minas Gerais has the second largest population of enslaved people in human history behind Bahia next door. And Brazil didn't abolish slavery until May 13th, 1888, officially the last country in the Western Hemisphere to ban the practice. Many plantation owners moved from Southern Brazil to, or U Southern United States to Brazil after abolition where they continued to enslave others for another 20 plus years. So the thing about Belo is that it was and is the blackest place I've ever lived. <laughs> so I think especially that first week there, I really had to confront all the internalized racism that I had from growing up in Madison. And, uh, you know, I saw it when my friend came to visit me for Carnaval, we were at this party and he was just like, wow, it's getting kind of hood. And I looked around I was like, this isn't hood at all, but it's very black. And I noticed that he had that same internalized racism that I had going into it. So just when people are like, all white people are racist, all men are sexist, and I would add all able-bodied people are ableist, what it means is that you don't even realize when it's happening. It's so ingrained into our hard wiring. That's what's so insidious. So I like this quote, we don't rise to the level of expectations, we fall to the level of our training. Because when you're under stress or you're having a panic moment, that's when the discrimination slips out. You know, it, a, a cop's not shooting somebody when he's happy right so that's just something to kind of help people wrap their heads around this and you know just to undo the work of the programming that's built into us um so this is where i started this is hebe out as nevis and at the time it was considered one of the most dangerous neighborhoods in the world and it was about a two-hour bus ride from downtown which is actually that mountain range in the back that's downtown so i ended up living about three blocks away from the central plaza and was very much immersed in queer, black, anti-fascist spaces. So for example, there was Samba the Man Noich, which is a bi-weekly Samba party in the same space. There was a monthly uh, Duelo de Mi Caesar MC battles. And uh, uh, there's this Todo the Sale. These are my friends. These are trans activists. They would hold dodgeball tournaments as a, as a form of protest. <laughs> Uh, this is La de Favelinha is the only uh, community center in a favela in a metro area of 6 million people. Um, so they do everything from dance workshops to, to fashion shows. And you really see how intersectional they are in terms of just like young, queer, black, poor, and still making things that are beautiful. Um, so one of the things that I learned in my time in Brazil is that race is a social construct in that it really, it varies depending on where you're at. So my friend Rodrigo on the right, he's the one that explained this to me because he's from the southern white part of Brazil that you see there, but we were in Minas Gerais, which is half black. And so he would explain to me that in southern Brazil, he was seen as, as preto or black, but in Minas Gerais, he was considered pardo or mixed. So literally even within the same country where he was changed his race. So that was significant for me because in the U.S. I'm seen as like Latino, but in Brazil, that's not a category. <laughs> I'm seen as white. I'm considered a white man coming from the U.S. with a college background, which is kind of the epitome of privilege. So, you know, with that mindset, I was like, well, I have these U.S. dollars. I got these organizing skills and there's so much raw talent. Well, why don't we do an art show? So these are my friends. So that's Wagner, Laís, Washington, Diego. And so we spent six months 
putting together a mercado cata cultural. But at the beginning, they were like, you need to be the face of this project when negotiating with ins with institutions to get spaces and resources because they're not going to take us seriously. And it, as a foreigner, it seems a little striking, but they're right. Um, so that's one of the things that you, as an ally and you got to negotiate resources, maybe you need to be the front of the project, at least externally, so that you can secure these resources and navigate around these, these racist systems. Uh, so that's the homie Wagner. So the exhibition itself, we showcased 40 artists, had 300 plus attendees. Uh, we, this is the first food drive that I ever did. And so we had like four to 500 pounds of food that we ended up donating to the community, a very successful event. Uh, and the next thing was I got to participate in Relações Etnico Raciais y Cultura Afro Brasileira or uh, Afro Brazilian Culture and Race Relations. So it was the first course taught by a black professor at the art department in UFMG, which is about 50,000 students, public institutions, so equivalent to UW Madison. So this is my professor, Josias Marino, who's a scholar, but also a children's book author. And one of the most impactful experiences is that we got to go and celebrate uh, uh, Festa da Libertação dos Escravos, basically the Juneteenth of Brazil, where they were celebrating the end of slavery with Os Arturos, which is a Comunidade Quilombola. So Comunidade Quilombolas are Afro-Brazilian communities founded mostly by people escaping its slave land. And the Arturos are a free black community in the Be Belo Horizonte metro area of Contagem that's been around since 1880, eight years before slavery was abolished in Brazil. So these are actual photos from that I took or from the art exhibition that we hosted. And uh, so yeah, just celebrating the end of slavery. Uh, another meaningful experience from that course is that we had a guest professor coming in and talk about affirmative action in Brazil, which at the time and probably still is based on a quota system. But something that she really stressed was the difference between escravo and pessoa escravizada or slave and enslaved. Because she was saying no one is ever a slave. They are enslaved by the society around them. The word slave attempts to claim a person's identity and dehumanizes them. So it's just something to consider. Um, and also just that was my first time formally really researching the African diaspora and incorporating in my work. So these are two references that I was looking at. I ended up making this book with my friend Lais, who was one of the organizers of Mercado. And so these are tools that I use now to teach black youth about the African diaspora. <laughs> so uh, coming back to Madison, two uh, uh, significant things was one was moving into the Arthur Lord Housing Cooperative, which is a a uh, 15 room housing cooperative that's pro feminist, pro queer, and pro people of color. And I lived there for about a year and a half, and oftentimes it was majority trans. So, very much a full immersion into a lot of the issues that we're talking about today. And the other part is I took over the 100, art, 100 state art program, 100 arts. Um, I also got to work with Bo Borealis, who is an art activist, and at the time they were an adjunct professor at the UW teaching an art and social justice course. So I was the TA, and basically I would go with undergrads to different community centers around the city, and we would teach art workshops from a social justice lens. And it was a lot of fun. So here's melting crayons to celebrate diversity. <laughs> but one of the things that I will say is uh, to not over promise to kids. Because I had a couple students that I really connected with and I was like, all right, well after the semester ends, I'll just, I'll come back once a month or something. And I never did. And I still regret it. So just don't over promise to kids because I, I haven't forgotten about it. <laughs> Um, and so we started doing art shows again with 100 State, and this one, Intimate Systems, was exploring the intersection between art and science. And I thought it was like an easy one to start with. We're coming into a research town, uh, and I know we're getting into deep water later, so I thought we could at least segue with this one. And so we hosted the opening party in Valentine's, big success, a lot of food drive. Um, you know, a bunch of people came out, had a good time. The exhibition itself was beautiful. But 
we so this piece in particular <laughs> got a lot of heat so this is gender reveal party and what you're seeing is five baby onesies on a string and on they have uh, anatomically correct human genitalia on them so on the left is a stereotypical female sex on the right is the uh, stereotypical male sex and in between would be what's considered intersex so it's saying how sex in nature is a spectrum much how gender is a spectrum in society and so it's not just a, a, a mental gymnastics thing. But what happened with uh, Gender Reveal Party is that it started getting complaints from guests. So uh, we ended up moving it to what I called the censored corner. And then it got more complaints. So finally, like, my boss was like, all right, well, we got to take it down. But I was like, all right, well, if we're going to censor this piece, then we're going to talk about it because this is serious. And... So we hosted this group discussion. We invited the two uh, artists, Professor Allison Gates and Dr. Daniel Meinhart, also uh, Eric Serda and Orion Wells from the Wisconsin Trans Health Coalition. And we had a community forum to talk about it. And me as, well, Allison, unfortunately couldn't make it last minute, so just a note. But as the face of 100 State, I got roasted <laughs> got super roasted and uh, two artists in particular kate moran and sashi mishir are disability activists and they really put uh 100 state to task on being an ableist boys club so i will just take a moment on some of the things i learned about ableism real quick so here's a couple ableist slurs to reconsider so crazy nuts insane dumb lame crippled blind these are all commonly used in our everyday language and they're slurs against disabled folks so i think it's a great example of how discrimination can be embedded into us without even realizing another thing that someone's brought out to me is like especially in a town where there's a lot of powered scooters and bikes if you see a scooter blocking the sidewalk just move it out of the way because if someone's in a wheelchair or, or on crutches or something it's really hard to navigate around that um so the next where we're at is uh, all right so and then just what ended up happening is we created an online forum that would place responsibility for taking the pieces down on the member to explain why they want it down instead of 100 state to have to justify its, its existence and the other thing was just actively seeking community feedback about challenging works so these this photo series by nicole piccietti documents the transformation of a drag queen and uh, I figured it might be a little incendiary. So I literally went around the whole space and talked to people individually and got their approval to put the piece up. And it was a, a non-issue. But I think that's what it takes, is just having that conversation. Um, so the next exhibition we hosted is Rewoven. Um, so I originally wanted it as a tribute to my mom and all the moms in my life, um, but just realizing that no one at the time was doing art shows centered on representing female artists in the community. Um, but one immediate personal failure on my part was trying to get professional support from a trans activist uh, for an event originally targeted at women. So that's inappropriate and disrespectful. So, you know, definitely don't do that. Uh, but in the hopes of trying to be more inclusive, we extended the vision of the, to incorporate uh, trans and non-binary artists. But at the time when we were organizing the show, we didn't have any non-binary folks in, that were putting it together. Uh, so we actually ended up delaying the event for a month, partnered with the Wisconsin Trans Health Coalition, uh, these cats on the right. And so they helped us curate the exhibition and we also had a trans one-on-one training at 100 state to just learn more so i'm well and the exhibition itself is beautiful you know it's very much worth the the struggle <laughs> but so let me just share some of the stats from that trans 101 training so trans women of color's life expectancy is just 35 years old a quarter of all trans women of color will be murdered and the murder rate is increasing in 2019, there were 29 reported deaths in the U.S. There were 26 in the first seven months of 2020. More than 50% of crimes against the queer community is targeted at trans women. Almost 100% of trans folks will suffer some kind of anti-trans violence in their lifetimes. So what happened is we had the opening party starting out sorry, and it was great. 
but the next night literally was Pulse. So folks that don't know what Pulse was, on June 12, 2016, 49 people were killed and 53 others injured in an Orlando gay club. It was the deadliest attack against a queer community in U.S. history and the largest terrorist attack since 9-11. And uh, so as an organization, it's like, well, why are we going to promote this party when the community's in mourning? So we held space and we were open and available. If anybody want to come, check out the art, grab a plate of food. But, I, you know, we were definitely not promoting publicly at all because it would just not be in good taste. Um, and so when we were on, I was with Orion on the way to the radio station to promote the show and we were pulled over by a cop and I watched the cop dead name Orion. So dead naming is when someone intentionally or not refers to a person who's trans by the name that they used before they transitioned. And that is considered disrespectful. So just something to keep in mind. Um, another project that I worked on actually with Sarah is Sway because we realized that we were privileged and that we were some of the few folks in Madison that actually had access to event spaces. So we're like, well, there's all these great talented artists. So why don't we just create space for emerging artists of color with an emphasis on queer black femmes. And uh, I think it was like eight to 10 events. We literally started with 30 people in a night. And by the end, we had a 30 minute line out the door uh, on this bottom left corner. That's Kenny. And Kenny is on the top 25 of the Billboard chart now. And that was his first event ever. <laughs> so not taking responsibility for his success, but I think it's just proof of concept. Um, but what ended up happening with Sway is the second time that I booked the cis male act, folks at Audrey warned me that he was predatory and to just not book him. And I didn't listen because uh, this is someone that I was friends with, I've been working with for years, and I didn't want Sarah to have to change the flyer, literally. But what ended up happening was that the person got blackout drunk. They started an hour late. They pushed the headliner back. It was actually the resident DJ's farewell party, and so that got messed up, too. And we basically caught so much smoke that we just never hosted another Sway again. And I take full responsibility for that. So uh, just on toxic masculinity, which is refers to the traditional culture of masculine norms that can be harmful to men, women, and society overall. So in this case, not listening to the warnings of oppressed individuals and just trying to push through all my plans, that is just a result of the toxic masculinity that I carry with me and always will. So it's something that I'm learning to deprogram. Um, so the last exhibition I hosted at 100 State was Motherlands, which was uh, showcasing uh, immigrant artists. This was right after Trump got elected. So I really felt the need to plant the flag and make some kind of a comfortable space for immigrants. Um, and the next thing was the Making Justice Program, which is a partnership with uh, Madison Public Library's Bublet Program and uh, Professor Faisal Abdullah, as well as myself. So we were teaching art workshops for incarcerated and court-involved youth. So just to understand the, some of the realities of this is uh, talking about the race equity report. Um, so in 2011 in Dane County, Blacks had an unemployment rate of 25% versus 5% for whites. 54% of Black residents live below the poverty line versus 8.7% of whites. 75% of Black children lived in poverty versus 5.5% of white children. Juvenile arrest rates at 469 per thousand for blacks versus 77 per thousand for whites. African American adolescents, while constituting less than 9% of the county's youth population, made up almost 80% of all the local kids sentenced to the state's juvenile correctional facility in 2011. 52% of black youth did not graduate high school in four years versus 16% of whites. In my experience, my seventh grade class at Toki, I had 16 black classmates. Not a single one of them graduated with me. Oof. So just going back to the workshops, one fall workshop turned into 43 and I ended up in one semester, I ended up leading, being the lead workshop facilitator for a couple semesters. So we, these are the two art exhibitions that we did with the Making Justice program. Lots of guest artists, curriculum based on students' identities and interests. Um, so screen printing, and then you see them up at the art show, the string gardens, you see them hanging. And so we had one person that was interested in how do you bring up trauma 
and, without making things worse. <laughs> so with uh, too much sauce in particular, it was half college students and half high schoolers. But after like the fifth workshop, I noticed that they weren't really clicking. So I was like, all right, we got to do something about this. So what I did is I partnered up one high schooler with one college student. And uh, we did a storytelling workshop where I opened it by talking about uh, when my buddy Bruce, who's one of my best friends, he actually drowned in a lake in front of me. And then I opened up the floor where I had each partner talk about one time they had to overcome some kind of adversity. And then we got the group together and I had their partner talk if they'd ever had to over, you know, if they'd ever had a similar experience. And it was actually a very powerful thing. We were surprised at how much kids shared. So all the words that you see in their portraits, that's actually from that workshop. Um, and uh, we tried it another time much earlier in the season and it was not successful. So I think it's really just important to build that trust and do it deeper in the semester. Otherwise, kids are not gonna be willing to be vulnerable. Um, so I hope that answers that. Uh, so this is too much sauce, you had the opening. And then even after I left Madison, I was still doing projects. I still do projects. So this is a, a intake wing at the, the um, at juvenile detention center in Madison. So we did that with a group of kids. It's a student design. And when they went to the National Library Association's annual conference in Philly, I got to go out and, and present with them. So it was also, or one thing I, my apologies, going back to uh, the partnerships with, um, making justice is we also did what's called like food justice so the, the kids most of these kids live in like the poverty crest and on the outskirts of town where they don't really have access to a variety of food so every week we'd have a different meal from a different culture we also took the kids to go visit black owned restaurants and just expose them to entrepreneurship um, and yeah so then i moved to long beach and which is part of LA County. And one of my first experiences, I went to visit my friend Darlene, who works in a museum in LA. And so it was a fashion show and I went in line and I, I was, there were some folks in line. So I was like, oh, are you guys in line? And one of them turned to me and she's like, oh, well, she is. And I realized that one of the two folks was actually a trans woman and I was being disrespectful toward her. And she was super nice about it, but it always imprinted on me where it's like, if you know better, do better. And I definitely knew better. So at that point I took it really seriously to try to not be using gendered language. So I spent two years as a server at the bar at the Queen Mary and I always use like, hey folks, how y'all doing today? Is everybody doing okay? Because those are non-gendered. So it doesn't make people feel uncomfortable. And instead of like, hey ladies or, or gentlemen, or what could I get y'all or, you know, so just things to keep in mind. Or, or also like, don't ask the baby's gender. Don't ask if people have a boy or girlfriend. Just be mindful of that gendered language. Um, I've also been a part of Art Realm for going on three years. So that's my friend Brandy who runs it. And the article just came out. But, uh, you know, just the idea of accepting and supporting Black queer femme leadership. So instead of trying to insert myself at the forefront of this movement, just to plug in what was already going on and just figure out how to support it. I think that's really important. Um, on the left, so that was an exhibition that was centering female voices. It was very much like rewoven, but it was like, all right, instead of trying to make art, about women or femmes, I was like, well, let me just work the front desk and be of service. You don't always have to be at the forefront. So um, I also got to spend some time uh, in South America last year. So on the left, those are my friends, uh, Hope and Somaj, and they live in Pequena, Africa, or Little Africa in Rio, which is basically the port where all the folks that were enslaved were brought in and uh, building their community. So they gave me a tour around the neighborhood and one of the places we stopped at was a museum that well so during the olympics they were expanding the train system and they found a massive block wide graveyard that were for folks that didn't survive the trip so i'm not going to show you photos because it's horrifying but i do think it's important to understand that uh, these countries are built on genocide and uh, slavery so we did that. Um, this is a, a marketplace where people were sold that got found during the Olympics expansion. And I'm pretty sure they bulldozed it. So 
So that was Brazil in the spring. I also got to go to Cartagena in Colombia in the fall, which is the capital of Afro-Colombian culture. So, you know, these are just nice experiences to share with my students that realistically are not going to get those opportunities to travel. Um, I've also been working with Artworks LA for the past year, which are very much like Making Justice, but they've been going at it for about 29 years. Um, so one thing I will say is during our first all staff meeting, which is about 30 plus artists, it was still cis men dominating the conversation. So one thing is, if you're a person of privilege, intentionally limit your voice so others can be heard. I saw this again at the, this is the Vincent Price Art Museum, which is an awesome museum in East LA that it's all black and brown living artists and uh, it's a Latina executive director all this and so when we did our introduction everybody was going around and doing their preferred gender pronouns but all the cis dudes were like looking around patting their pockets as if like they lost their wallet or something like it's not a big deal just he him his she her hers they them theirs that's it so just don't make a big deal about it it's you know it's a two second thing, um, but very Brown centric, very dope. Uh, so I've been teaching kids in Compton in Linwood, which is right next to Compton, just around different parts of LA and just teaching kids a culturally responsive curriculum. So it's not about what you want to teach, but what they want to learn. So looking at elements from the culture that you can incorporate. So it's for, like my Compton kids, it's easy. -E. So if you want to talk about cultural appropriation in this case, when a person or group takes a piece of culture from somewhere else and uses it for their own benefit, often to make money, fashion, or a joke. So teaching kids how to think critically about identity. Um, in this case, this would be cultural repurposing. Sometimes an oppressed group will take their culture, their oppressor or colonizer to create something unique to their own identity. It's often an act of rebellion. So on the left, those are Portuguese tile patterns. And based on it, I made the spray paint design. And then with my Linwood kids, I taught them this whole process. So then they got to do it as well. Um, so to go along with it, I bring in guest artists from their communities. So this is Melissa Govea Tochlita from South Central. And she's a great upcoming artist. But it was like, all right, well, you know, I, I can literally give you a little bit of the money that I'm getting paid. And you can come in and you can work with the kids and it's setting up that organic mentorship model. So this was Mel De Paz from Compton. And she was great because she got my Compton kids to really re-examine where their surroundings are at and find pride in it. So this is Compton, the city of hope, you know, or Mariscos, the, the legal food truck hustle, you know, or mi gente, just pride in the fruteros. And so this piece is, so I also, the hardest assignment I've ever had was teaching art workshops at Camp Joseph Page, which is a youth prison camp in the mountains of LA. Uh, and so I was there for four months, taught two workshops, a morning and afternoon one. And it was very impactful. But one, one incident in particular I'll mention where I had, it was our first day with chalk markers. The kids were only allowed to use pencil and chalk. So to get around it, I brought in chalk markers. But I had a kid literally snatch a bag out of my hands and stole it. And the support st at that point, instead of reaching to the kid's jacket and try to fight him over it, I just took a step back and let the support staff handle it. And the support staff did not do anything. So at that point, I was like, all right, well, we just can't bring markers anymore because something bad happens. I have no way to fix it. But again, it's not your job to be the disciplinarian. Um, and I, just to mention, teach kids alternative canons of history and art representation is so important. Uh, and then just to go, you know, uh, bringing in these female artists is just to model and discuss how to collaborate with other artists and take inspiration without stealing their ideas because black, indigenous, and POC femmes in particular have been historically robbed of their ideas and work by cis heterosexual men and white institutions. So teach your youth to do better. And that led me to the protests. So this is us obviously in the streets in Long Beach. So one thing that I will say, cause there's, you know, so much of it is online, especially since the news outlets don't really report a lot of this stuff. So just to be a credible source of information on the right, so this is the post that I made talking about just police corruption and it got shared 47 times and that's not to brag or anything. It's just that like people are watching and you don't know how they're gonna take your information. So just try to be as factual as possible. I made a post talking about how the federal government 
assassinated Martin Luther King Jr. But so I literally went to the Department of Justice and I pulled up their article talking about the case. So no one can argue with me about it. This is a fact. So I really just push people to be as credible as possible and to, you know, just check your sources before you just post, especially, you know, opinion based articles and you know, took to the streets and trying to make some art that supports the movement. And really that ended up being the foundation for a whole summer of art workshops uh, with youth of just taking the old English that I was doing with my LA kids and just using it to help them digest all of the protest stuff that's been going on. And so one of my favorite parts of it is teaching the kids. So on, in that back, that's actually the juvenile detention center and the Dane County building. And so I got to teach my kids that were locked up about how there was that huge defund police painted in front. <laughs> now, and, you know, just the fact that, like, even though the kids aren't, can't really see it, that there's people right outside the door fighting for them. I thought that was a very powerful experience. And so just talking about the defunding police and what it could even look like. So this is something that I would suggest because currently police departments can go like 40, 50, 60% of city budgets. So why don't we just limit it to 30% on a national le level and officers were required to live within three miles of communities that they serve. I bet you they'd be a lot more empathetic to their neighbors than to someone in a different community. Um, and as far as redistributing budgets, so people are so afraid of it, but I think right now we're in a situation where cops have so many responsibilities that there's no way that they can do all of them well. And so I'll just give a historical example of where black activism defunded police and it was to the benefit of everybody. So this is the Freedom House Ambulance Services founded in 1967 to serve the predominantly Black Hill District of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, it was stacked with black men and women from inner city areas of Pittsburgh America, America's previous emergency services system was virtually non-existent. Medical emergencies were handled by police officers who tossed patients in paddy wagons to be rushed to hospitals. Freedom House Ambulance Service would set the standard for emergency care nationally and even internationally. So I don't want a cop to take me to the hospital. I'm glad we have ambulances. And I think, for example, with mental health issues, why is it that you have to call the police? Why isn't there a way where you can call a social worker or someone without a gun to come and handle these issues that have masters and doctorates to handle these situations? So what, what I propose is you, you, you know, everybody's so afraid of crime. So I'm not even going to touch that. But why don't you just look at these other services that the police are currently required to fill because we don't have another solution and you reallocate those resources. So, and the final thing that I'm going to leave on is about holding, this is specifically talking to cis men. And so it's holding your abusive friends accountable. So I think we all know folks that have been accused of sexual assault and uh, all too often cis het men uh, just don't take it seriously and don't address it. So this is something that I'm currently working through. This is a chronological <laughs> workshop. Uh, so in my small group, we talking about one friend. So we just got together when we finally discussed our individual pieces of information and figured out there was a pattern of behavior. So at that point, we made a plan about how to address it. And the next step was that we chose to write letters to this individual since it's something that can't be deflected or escaped from, but also just understanding that while the person might respond, grow and change, you will likely lose them as a friend. But in this time of elevated consciousness, we have to raise the bar about the kind of people that we let into our lives. So I like this quote a lot where it says, let go or be dragged. So very much, sometimes you have to let go of the friends that aren't doing the work or you're gonna get dragged down with them. And so my final thing, homework for cis men, is to find and watch the series called I May Destroy You, which I think is incredible and really talks about issues of sexual assault and all the different shades that it can take and in a very human perspective. So that's the main actor and also the writer. So that's my one piece of homework for cis men. And uh, yeah, that's all I got. So we'll just open it up and see if folks have any thoughts.
you, Carlos, Thank for you. walking us through your um, your journey uh, and the very interesting stories you shared with us. Um, one person did ask a question in the chat, and then um, we'll go through this last question. And then, Carlos, um, would you be willing to share your contact information if people had other questions oh, for you absolutely. offline? Excellent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll share that with everyone afterwards. Um, but the question that was asked in the chat um, was, it seems like most people speak about performative allyship with negative connotations, but it also seems like defund the police planted on the street in front of a juvenile detention center could be considered a performative. Can you talk a little bit more about performative allyship? Sure. Well, so the way that I frame it for the kids is that defund police is basically the concept was taken from painting Black Lives Matter in front of DC and like New York and stuff like that. So a lot of the Black Lives Matter protesters are like, that's performative because what we want you to do is defund the police. We don't want a big Black Lives Matter. Um, so when to me, the direct action is the fact that it's painted in front of the place where they incarcerate children. And so that and so what I teach kids is like, if you know, because uh, the workshop that I've been teaching them is how to make action statements that push towards change. So the phrase Black Lives Matter, it's kind of abstract, like it doesn't actually push for anything. Whereas defund police, it's action. So that's what I look for. Um, I, well, it is very visible, but I think if you look also at the organization that did that piece, Freedom Inc., they're incredibly radical. And I think in terms of cross coalition, uh, or, or cross cultural coalition building, so this is a Black and Southeast Asian organization that's trying to address issues of inequity in Madison. Um, and I think they're the strongest equivalent to Black Lives Matter in Madison. So I think. If you just look at the overall body of work of that organization, it's definitely on the act of allyship tip. Thank you so much, Carlos. That was a great, um, great way to uh, finish this. Um, con well, not finish, but put a pause on this conversation because I hope it continues. I hope that everyone on this call will take what Carlos said, think about how it may impact their lives and how they can uh, bring things forward and carry things forward. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that. Um, again, everyone, I want to remind you to sign up for the newsletter for Dean Arts. That's how you'll find out about great conversations such as this, other art opportunities, um, and examples of things that are out there. So sign up for that newsletter. Um, Sarah's dropping the link in the chat box, and we'll make sure that we'll share that with everyone. Um, also, we have a um, an eval from today's uh, workshop. So if you can fill that out for us, it gives us some great feedback. If you have other ideas for workshops, please let us know. Um, and speaking of using the word workshop so many times, I do want to remind you that our next workshop is coming up on September 9th. It's with Mary Reinders and it's talking about art as a way forward. Um, so we are always looking forward and looking at what we can do to grow. So make sure you join us for that next one. It will be on Facebook Live and recorded and we'll be able to share that with you later. So. Without um, anything more, we thank you all for being here tonight and um, be safe and be well. All right, y'all. Thank you so much. Have a good night.